Thank you for attending Marine Science Day. We are so excited to have attendees from all over the world with us today. My name is Allie Hall and I'll be your host for this session. It is my pleasure to introduce Pam Mason, a research scientist at VIMS who will be discussing coastal resilience, helping communities adapt to rising waters. After her presentation, we'll have a Q&A session in which Pam will get to answer your questions on the topic. So without further ado, I will turn it over to Pam. So good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Pam Mason, as Allie said, and I'm gonna talk to you today a little bit about um, tidal flooding information and adaptation measures. And I'm gonna focus a little bit on Virginia because that's where I do a lot of my work, but I'm gonna hopefully have a little something for everyone. So we're talking about the issues of sea level rise, coastal flooding, storm surge, um, some or all of those things together. And this is um, a global and very much a local problem. Um, specifically here in Southeastern Virginia, we have one of the highest rates of relative sea level rise, but it's happening pretty much along all of the coastal United States. There are a few exceptions, but, and, and also in communities throughout the world. So that you might ask the question, so how much will tidal waters rise in my community? And so in Virginia, we have a tool that's called ADAPT-VA. And I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit about some of that tool and information that's available there. And if you're outside Virginia, we also have sea level um, report cards on ADAPT Virginia that might provide information for your community, but you can also check with local experts and um, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration has a sea level rise viewer, so you might check there. So this is the um, welcome page to ADAPT VA, and you can see that there's actually two addresses for it. It's um, ADAPT VA spelled out as one word, .org or .com. And the, when you first enter the page, you can see that there's several different buckets of information. And the first one I'm going to talk to you about is the forecast bucket. This bucket is where you can get information about actual water levels and sea level rise projections and the sea level report cards that I mentioned. So if you look at the first column, there's, a, there's an information um, bucket called water levels. And if you go into there, you can actually pull up a graph and you can look at the um, information projections that come from NOAA, the science work on um, the sea level rise projections that have been done at VIMS. And also for our local folks in Virginia, we've had two notable um, large storms, um, Hurricane Isabel and um, tropical storm Irene, and you can also look at the water levels from that. As I pointed out, if you're not in Virginia and you're in one of the other coastal localities from the map at the bottom of my slide, you can open up the C U.S. Um, sea level report cards and you can get a similar graph to the one that I'm showing on the left for Virginia. So once you have this information and you're talking about dealing with too much water on your, pro on your property, so what, what to do about that? So the first thing, obviously, is you want to sort of figure out where the water's coming from um, and what your problems are. So, you know, do you have a flooding problem or do you have an erosion problem or both? And so flooding waters can obviously come from tidal waters. We can have riverine flooding. We can have rainwater flooding. And obviously in a large storm, you can have all of those at one time. And when you get down to tidal flooding, Sometimes we have our daily tides that come in every day. We have spring high tides that are higher levels. And then we have tides that are pushed behind storms and we call those often just storm tides. Then the idea of erosion is a little bit different. Um, it results in the loss of soil, but it's often associated with water and too much water and storm water because um, fast moving water and or water that's being driven by waves is um, a very common cause of erosion. So on the shoreline, you might have erosion caused by waves and along streams and riverfronts, you might have it just caused by water flow or um, large rain events. So again, what do we do with too much water? So today I'm gonna to talk to you about nature-based solutions. So this is basically taking advantage of natural features that occur in our landscapes now that provide services for us. So marshes, beaches, dunes, and um, vegetated buffers already provide erosion protection and some flood benefits because they create space between your house or your car or your um, deck and the waterway. So first of all, the space can, can often absorb or store some of that flood water. 
And then those plants also slow down wave energy and water flow so they can also protect against the energy behind the, the storm water or the flooding waters protect from erosion, but they, at the same time, they provide lots of other services. They can improve water quality and provide habitat and often can be a long-term solution because it's natural. So there's two common um, phrases that we use when we're talking about using marsh, beach, or dunes as the, the first two pictures on my slide. Um, these are often called living shorelines. So in the top picture, we have a tidal marsh with a little sill, the little structure in front of the marsh to help protect the marsh so the marsh protects your property. And in the second picture, we have a planted beach um, that's behind a breakwater system. And then the lower picture, another phrase um, that's commonly used is the upland portion of it, which we call conservation landscaping or um, beneficial landscaping. And this again also uses vegetation to slow and absorb rainwater and reduce pollution and it deals with the wet soils, some of the flooded, flooded soils. So I wanted to direct you to um, some tools that are on the ADAPT BA website again. So I'm gonna focus on this um, bucket that's tools. And when you open that up, one of your options, um, there's several options, but I'm gonna to focus today on the interactive map. So here's an example of what the interactive map looks like. I happen to be showing a portion of Virginia that's Gloucester Point, which is where the VIMS campus is. So I picked that. Um, and you can see that there's several different um, tabs. They're the blue buttons at the bottom of the screen that have different kinds of information in them. The first one I'm gonna focus on today is the sea level rise and flooding tab. And I'm showing this one so that you can get an idea of where you can get information about your property if you live in Virginia. And in this case, <clears throat> the little purple, purple pinkish um, button right in the middle, I'm gonna use my cursor right here, I clicked on that button ahead of time to get this um, view for you all. And it opens up a box that's highlighted in red. And that shows projections over the years through to 2100 of what the water level will actually be on that spot into the future. So that just gives you an idea of how much water might be above your surface. So you have an understanding of what you might consider as your choices. And of course, these choices can be um, made for an individual property or they can also be considered from more of a community perspective, like maybe there's a whole section of a waterfront or a whole community that might want to work together on some solutions. So I'm going to show a little bit of another close up of, a, of another um, choice. So this is the shoreline management one. And this is where we really spend at the Center for Coastal Resources Management, where I'm um, located at VIMS, we spend a lot of time working on providing guidance and information on shoreline management decision making. And this model, the shoreline management model here, provides outputs based on lots of different physical and biological data on what the best choice would be for a particular piece of shoreline. And you can see that it comes with, it puts out many different kinds of options. And when you go into a piece of shoreline, like this one is green and this one is purple, you can see you can match it up with your, your output here and it will identify the treatment that's preferred based on Virginia's policy. Now, currently Virginia has a statewide policy to actually prefer what we call living shorelines as I talked about before. Um, and so if you look at the shoreline management model, and in this case, I have a fairly quiet waterway, but I've pointed out which of the features are actually considered um, living shorelines by definition in Virginia. And so in other words, it's the ones that use the marsh these two use marsh and this one uses beach to actually help protect your shoreline. So the non-structural living shoreline is, a, is an example where you're using marsh grass. Um, a pl the plant marsh with sill, which is sometimes called a hybrid living shoreline, if you've heard that term, that's planting the marsh grass, but then also including a structure in front of the grass to help protect the grass. So the structure protects the front ends of the grass and then the width of the marsh protects your property by slowing um, slowing um, wave energy and redu well, reducing energy and reducing wave height both. So slowing the water movement across, across the marsh surface. And then the final one that, that I don't have an example of here in this particular slide is um, a beach and an offshore breakwater. And again, that's using sand, um, either existing sand or preferably bringing in additional sand to build a really wide beach and then protecting that beach in place with an offshore breakwater. 
So um, the other thing that you can think about when you're um, considering what your options are for adaptation is, again, as I mentioned earlier, the sort of community perspective. So um, I have a, a screen capture here of the Hampton River in Hampton, Virginia. And looking at this, I have two different kinds of information that, that we offer through this tool to help folks at maybe a community level or local decision makers um, review projects and provide information on um, what they might do in terms of natural based solutions. And in this case, I have two different um, pieces of information. So the red dots that are on the screen are target areas for restoration to um, provide benefits to coastal buildings. So we have a, a project at, at um, VIMS that we've conducted to look at all coastal buildings in Virginia, 170,000 or so coastal buildings. And we've done some modeling to determine where there are natural based features near those buildings. Where there's no natural based feature near the building between the waterway and the building, we've identified those spots as target areas. So places where adding those features in would really help provide some benefits to those buildings. So those are the orange buckets here. So these are the target areas. The other information I'm showing on the screen is living shorelines. And living shorelines, again, I pointed out in our, in our uh, shoreline management model. But in this case, we actually have additional information where we've ranked those shore, um, living shorelines. And we've ranked them according to a couple features that they provide. So as I noted, living shorelines can provide habitat features and water quality protection features. And so the ranking that's on here if you go into the Adapt Virginia tool, you can dive in deeper and you can click on it and find out exactly what it is for each location. But basically we've done a combination or what is often called co-benefits. So a benefit that's shared with another benefit for this feature. And in this case, we're focusing on water quality benefits, habitat benefits, whether or not it provides one of these target areas, as I mentioned previously here, and also whether or not that living shoreline is in a community that's had an assessment for um, social vulnerability. And that work was actually done with a, uh, a collaborator at, at the main campus at William Mary. And so we've combined those all together in a ranking. And so what it gives is, is a sort of co-benefits or combined benefits of installing a natural living shoreline in that location. Um, the living shorelines benefits, as I said before, can also they can be cumulative. So you can have a small piece of a living shoreline, or if you look at this map, you can see where there's huge stretches where if you implemented living shorelines together like that, you'd start getting sort of community level resilience. And um, as I pointed out before, that would start providing not only the erosion protection that the living shorelines are, are sort of intended to provide, but some flood mitigation, water quality improvement. Now you're starting to get habitat for fish and crabs and shorebirds, um, open space, aesthetics, and there's actually a feature in the um, National Flood Insurance Program where if communities have certain amount of open space right along their shoreline, they can potentially get credit that allows them to lower the cost of that flood insurance. So there's a, an economic, potential economic benefit there as well. So what does that, where, where can you get more information about this if you're interested in living shorelines? So um, at uh, the Center for Coastal Resources Management at VIMS, we have a living shorelines page. Um, that page provides lots of information from design alternatives to the type of vegetation you might use. We have a, a robust research and monitoring program. Um, several of our scientists lead an effort to continue to study living shorelines to see exactly how they work, where they work, um, the best way to design them. And we link through to all that research, um, peer reviewed publications, gray literature, e-news is, we have all kinds of different ways to, to provide information. And that website is over here. And then I just wanted to point out because living shorelines actually have a fairly broad range of applicability that in Virginia, there's a, a great portion of the shoreline. All the stuff in blue is potentially suitable for a living shoreline. And it's basically anywhere that has moderate to low energy, which is a fetch of, a, of about less than two miles and preferably um, where there's existing marsh or beach, although you can also establish marsh as a living shoreline where maybe there isn't a marsh now, but it still might be suitable. So that's um, the end of my presentation for today and I'm open for questions. Awesome. Thank you so much, Pam, for that great talk. We can now open uh, to the Q&A session. I can go ahead and start 
with a question of my own, which is that if um, what would be an ending note maybe that you would give to a new home buyer or a new home, yeah, home purchaser that is looking to purchase on the water, but doesn't quite know what to look out for, um, for like things like threat from sea level rise or might be interested in uh, coastal or living coastlines. So I do think that obviously if you're in Virginia, I would suggest that you can in the ADAPT VA, I didn't show this capacity, but when you first open up the viewer, there's a search box and you can actually type in your address. And so you can see all of that information plus the buckets I didn't show you that also include other information, like whether you have a marsh near your shoreline, you can pull that up too. So in some of those other features, you can find out even more information. Um, and then again, if you're outside of Virginia, um, NOAA has a sea level rise viewer that will do the same thing for you. So you can find information about the sea level rise piece and maybe about your natural features. So um, that's a good place to start. Okay, a follow-up question to that would be, are all living shorelines created equal or are some you know, better at buffering uh, rising seas than others? So um, for, for, all right, so, and, the answer is yes and no. Um, so most living shorelines in Virginia um, and through much of the Gulf Coast and the East Coast would include would in, typically include a plant called Spartina alterniflora, which is also called smooth cordgrass. And um, it tends to behave in any setting where it's happy to grow, it's gonna grow similarly. So in that sense, it's, it's comparable. Where things get different is what the slope of your actual yard is, right? So it would depend on what your back slope is. So how, what the elevation of your living shoreline would be on the back, like are you grading into a bank or is it just gonna, is the marsh gonna be flatter? And so a slightly steeper shoreline will allow for a different kind of wave response and wave movement than a, than a flatter shoreline. And so, um, you know, so it's sort of, there is some site specific, specificity <laughs> But, um, and I would point out that in other places like the West Coast, for instance, where Spartina is considered invasive, um, they have other species, but on the West Coast, there's lots of intertidal mudflat. And so they have, their places are non-vegetated, but mudflat also provides for wave breaks. Shallow water provides for some of that wave protection. And then my final question for this lovely session would be, uh, do stilts, houses on stilts provide, you know, equal bufferment from rising seas or is living shorelines really the way forward uh, for development? So the, the great interest in living shorelines is a combination of several things. One, most importantly, is the historic loss of marshes. So, um, you know, since, since the colonial period, it's been estimated that, that the the continental United States has lost 50% of its wetlands. Um, when you get to coastal marshes, that's still a really high percent because many of them were either removed by dredging or were filled for development of our cities. Um, and, and now marshes are also sometimes being lost due to sea level rise. So marshes have to locate themselves in a certain place on the landscape. And when the waters get too deep too often, the marsh won't, won't last, the plants drown. And so, it's a combination of trying to address the fact that marshes naturally provide erosion protection and really more erosion protection than flood protection, frankly. I mean, they're really much better at erosion protection, but there are some flood benefits in, in water storage and slowing down that flooding water. And so if you have a very low lying home, um, it's, it's, it's probably the best solution is to elevate that house. Um, that is something that can be done through often through grant um, processes with the Federal Emergency Management Agency. So in that case, it might be you do a combination of things. Often we talk about these things as layers of defense or combinations. So you might elevate your house and then still have a living shoreline. The living shoreline would help protect your yard and then your house would be protected from larger storm events. So sometimes it's not a one or the other, it's a both. Okay, and I actually misspoke. If you're willing, Pam, um, Imani has a question and they would like to know, could we see a change in aquatic species as the sea levels rise? 
Um, so the, bot the, the, the bottom line is yes. Um, so many different aquatic species have very specific places that they live within the water um, surface and or where they reproduce or seek refuge and, and nursery areas. So there is major concern, for instance, in the Chesapeake Bay and a lot of coastal um, landscapes, Gulf and, and East Coast, that we anticipate a, a fairly significant loss of tidal marsh. And because tidal marsh is a common nursery and feeding area for, for different kinds of shorebirds, but a nursery area for small fish like the fish and the blue crabs when they're juveniles, like rockfish, striped bass, croaker, puppy drum, um, blue crab, I think I mentioned blue crab, striped bass. Um, anyway, when they're little and they need to get away from bigger predators, often they seek they hide in the marsh amongst the grass when the when the tide is up. So if the marsh starts to disappear, it will lose some of that area that the critters can go when they're little to get to seek protection. The other thing is the marsh produces a lot of prior production, and I didn't talk about that today, but the marsh actually produces a lot of organic matter that ends up going in the basis of the food chain. So there'll be a little less organic matter production. So that will also affect what our, what our creatures, you know, how many we'll have and, and what they'll have. So good question. Awesome. Thank you so much, Pam. Mm -hmm. It looks like we are coming close to the end of the session. So I want to thank Pam Mason once again for that lovely talk uh, and helping us learn about the resources that VIMS have developed to assist coastal communities. It has been a pleasure for sure. Thank you all for joining us again. <laughs>